Hi, we're out on the range today, so please bear with gunfire you hear in the background. Today is part three in our series on tactics, and what we're going to cover today is some types of loading and unloading, some target engagement, and a couple of different shooting positions. And as usual, we're just going to hit the high points. If I really wanted to go in depth on these subjects, we could be here for days. But before we go into that, there's a couple of things we have to recap from part two. Let me show you something. In part two, I talked about when you're moving from one covered position to another that you would generally move away from the danger. And somebody asked, would you move toward the danger if that's where the better cover or the closer cover was? For example, if I were here and the danger were coming from basically where you are, I might move behind this vehicle to get cover, which is basically toward the threat. And would that be a better idea than trying to run all the way over here behind that building? Depending on the circumstances, that may very well be what you'd want to do. There are no absolutes. There is no always move away from the danger or never move toward the danger. Somebody else brought up that if you were behind cover and you wanted to go from here to another covered position, instead of going from A to B, could you back up, keeping this as cover between you and whatever danger is out there, until you can get a shorter distance between A and B, and then reduce the amount of time you're exposed to that danger. Yes, you can do that. That's a great idea. And that's just the kind of thinking you have to have. There was somebody that said the only absolute is that there are no absolutes and that he believed that absolutely. And that's a great way to put it. Now, in part two, we showed that shooting from the left side of cover is not going to cause malfunctions. Certainly not the kind positive. But there were some people that pointed out that for most of us, when you shoot from the left side of cover, you're using your non-dominant hand. And if you keep your arm too flaccid to properly manage recoil, that can lead to some malfunctions, and that certainly is correct. I didn't mention that because the term for that flaccid arm that leads to malfunctions is very politically incorrect, and I didn't want to offend anybody. But that having been said, people still wanted to see a couple of different types of firearms shot in this technique. Okay. One more gun? Okay. Now, let's get on to today's topic. The first thing I want to cover is loading. Well, that's easy enough. Put a magazine in, put a round in the chamber, feel for your loaded chamber indicator, or do a press check, hit your decock lever, put your safety on, whatever your pistol requires holster it, and off you go. There are some people that will add another step. They'll take a second fully loaded magazine, trade that out for their first one, then holster their pistol, put another round in this magazine, and then off they go. And what you've done is you've upped your capacity by one. The question is, is that a good idea? Well, for a lot of concealed carry type of handguns, an LCP, a Smith & Wesson bodyguard, upping your capacity from six to seven may be a very good idea. But when you do that, you always run into the possibility of creating some kind of mishap, screwing up one of your rounds, having a negligent discharge. Although I've done this drill over a thousand times and never had any problem with it, that chance is still there. And you have to do what you think is right for you. But when it comes to the really high capacity autoloaders, this Steyr GB has an 18-shot magazine. Am I going to top off? I find it very implausible that I'm going to get into a situation that I cannot resolve with 18 rounds, but I do resolve with 19. I find that less plausible than the chances of creating some kind of mishap when I do a top-off load. Now what about reloading? In citizen-involved shootings, reloading is rare, even with lower capacity handguns, but it's still a skill that I think should be practiced. There's many techniques, let me show you a couple that I use. The first is called a tactical reload. The idea is that shots have already been exchanged, but there's enough of a lull in the action allowing you to reload. Now let me show you how that works. You take out your spare magazine, rotate it between these fingers, 
put it in the pistol and then retain the outgoing magazine because it still has ammunition in it that you may need later. And it can be done fairly quickly. The second one is called a speed reload. You'll hear people talk about it as a combat reload or an emergency reload. I don't like to use inflammatory terms like that, so I want to use the term speed reload. And this is where the magazine is not retained. It's a little faster. You'll also notice that again, I don't look at the pistol, I look down range. Now here's where the question comes up, should you shoot your pistol until it's completely empty and your slide is locked back, or should you try to count the number of rounds in your magazine? With a lot of practice, you can keep track of how many rounds are in your magazine with a low capacity like six or seven. I've found that it is very difficult with capacities of 15 or greater. But you can get a feeling for how many rounds you fired, and you should be able to know when you're getting pretty close. And the idea is if you change magazines before you're completely out, then you still have one in the chamber, so if you're bobbling that reload, you can at least shoot the one down range. But the one thing I can really tell you is that if you eject your magazine and you've still got a couple of rounds left in it, these couple of rounds on the ground are a hell of a lot better than this in your hand. What most people will really do is shoot until they're completely empty and they'll be standing there with an empty magazine in their pistol and the slide locked back. At that point, what technique do you use to reload? Well, there's several. Let me show you three of them. One thing you can do is drop your magazine, put a new magazine in, and then overhand it. You grab the slide, push back until your slide lock disengages, and then let go, let it go forward. Another similar method is drop your magazine, put a new magazine in, and then grab it like a slingshot Pull back until your slide lock disengages, let it go forward. It's very important that when you pull back, you let it go, you don't ride it forward. And of course, a third method you could use is drop your magazine, put in a new magazine, and hit your slide release. Now in part two of this, people saw me reloading using the slide release, and there were some people that commented that was the wrong thing to do, and a couple of people said that they'd had several instructors tell them not to use the slide release because it can cause malfunctions or wear your gun out faster. Okay, the idea that using the slide release is going to increase the rate at which your gun wears out, not if you have anything above the lowest quality pistol. As far as it causing malfunctions, in any handgun I've ever fired that was of reasonable quality and was well maintained, using the right magazines, I've never had a malfunction by using the slide release. I only see that when the pistol has been very poorly maintained or someone has bought low quality aftermarket magazines. And even when using the slide release the, the malfunction does occur in those low quality guns, then attempting to slingshot it does not clear the malfunction. So, where do stories like that come from? Okay, what happens is some brands of handgun have slide releases that are undersized or very difficult to manipulate or difficult to find, and you have instructors that become a big fan of a particular brand of handgun, and then they teach students to use an overhand or slingshot technique because on that particular type of gun, the slide release isn't designed very well. But because they're big fans of that, they have to make up a reason for using an overhand technique rather than say, the pistol was poorly designed in that aspect. And you end up with a lot of stories like that. But the main thing you have to do is, depending on how your pistol is designed and how big or small your hand is and can you reach the slide release and things like that, you have to do what's right for you, try a few different techniques and come up with the way you want to do it. Well, when I say that, the inexorable follow-up question is, what technique do I use? I use the slide release, and I do that mainly for three reasons. First, there's no reason not to. Secondly, on some of the handguns I use, like this Beretta 92FS, if you try to use an overhand technique with its wide open system, for the most part, there isn't a lot to grab, and people get their fingers or the palm of their hand caught in that slide, and that's no fun. 
even if you use an overhand technique and get back here on the back where you need to, a lot of times when you do that, you inadvertently engage the hammer drop trigger deactivator. So you got a round in the chamber, but it doesn't go off. Even when you try to slingshot it, a lot of times that will still happen. You'll grab here and inadvertently engage the trigger deactivator. But the number one reason that I use the slide release is because I can do it one-handed and it doesn't really matter which hand the pistol is in. Now I'm sorry to be so long-winded about reloading but it is part of tactics and there were people who asked so there's one more thing I gotta cover and that is a handgun with a European style mag release. Now this is a Beretta model 1934 and I'm using it to demonstrate this basically because it's one of the very few handguns I have that has this type of mag release. Now there are exceptions but generally speaking auto loaders made for the American market have a lever or a button right here that you press and it pops your magazine out. Auto loaders made for the European market have a spring-loaded catch on the bottom of the magazine that just comes into place and holds the magazine in. This kind of handgun has some disadvantages. When it comes to releasing the magazine, you have to pull back this lever and hold it. If I release it, the spring-loaded catch just goes back in place and won't let the magazine fall out. Generally what you have to do is push back on it and pull the magazine out. Well when you do that, because you have to pull the magazine out, it lends itself well to tactical reloads. But when it comes to speed reloads, not only do you have to pull it out, but when you go to put the new magazine in, that spring-loaded catch partially obscures the mag well, and you have to push it out of the way to get your magazine in there. It is slower to reload for most people. Probably the biggest disadvantage of this is if you ever got into a situation where you had to reload with one hand, if there's a good way to do it, I haven't found it. Now, with an American style mag release, if you had to shoot and reload with one hand, that can be done if you practice it. And I know that sounds like something from the What If Brigade, but we also have a a presentation on the FBI's famous 1986 Miami Dade shootout and a couple of those guys did in fact get into some one-handed problems. And so to shoot and reload an American mag style release with one hand, you can do it. Clunky? Yes, but it can be done. With the European style mag release, as I said, really difficult. There are, however, some advantages of this type of mag release. One being if you have to buy aftermarket magazines. Now these days, finding original Beretta magazines for model 1934 can be hard to do. And so when I bought an extra magazine, I had to buy some off-brand Knock off magazine. Well, when you do that for guns with American style mag release, they have to have a notch or a hole cut in them so that retention lug inside the gun can go through there and keep it in the pistol. When you buy aftermarket mags, that notch is always cut the wrong shape, cut the wrong size, cut in the wrong place. For these, because you have the retention piece under the back of the magazine, that's not a problem. And if you have to buy cheap aftermarket magazines, they'll work in a gun with this type of magazine release far more often than a gun with an American type of mag release. The other big advantage of this is it's really truly ambidextrous. You use the exact same reloading technique with your, with your left hand as you do with the right. You don't have to change techniques, just change the hand you use. But the big question is, how fast can you do a speed reload with this type of pistol? Well, let's see how fast I can do it. As fast as the American style mag release? No. Fast enough? You be the judge. I want to cover a couple of things about supported positions, specifically kneeling and prone. 
You probably wouldn't use positions like this very often, but I want to get them out there anyway. Now let me start with the kneeling. It has a couple of great advantages. First, that it's easy to get into. Just step in, rock back, put the back of your support arm against your knee, and you can get a really good stable platform. Also, it's easy to get out of. But does it really help in giving you any better groups? Well, I've got two targets set up here at 100 yards. I'll shoot the target on your left offhand, and then the target on your right from the kneeling, and let's see if there's any difference in the group. And now we'll try kneeling. Let's take a look at the targets. So how'd we do? Well, shooting offhand, I fired six shots. I've got four on the silhouette, one miss, and one unaccounted for. Given the drop, I think it went under the target. But with kneeling, I fired six shots, and I've got all six on the silhouette. Not a stellar group, but I am shooting 100 yards with Winchester white box ammunition. But what we can see is six hits versus four, so a significant improvement in accuracy. Right about now is when a lot of people say that you would never shoot 100 yards. Well, I have been in a situation where, with a 1911 45 ACP, I had to shoot at an adversary that was about 100 yards away. So rare, but it happens. Now, let's paste up our shot holes and try the prone. Now I'll shoot the target on your left offhand and the target on your right from the prone position. So how'd we do? Shooting offhand, I fired six shots and I've got five on the silhouette. The sixth isn't on the paper. I'd love to blame it on the wind, but it's probably just me. Now, shooting from the prone, I also fired six shots and again, I've got five on paper. So in this case, it doesn't seem to have helped my accuracy at all. In fact, if you put a numerical score on it, offhand I got 20 and from the prone I got 21. So although shooting from various shooting positions can help a lot of times, the prone doesn't seem to help me that much at all. But more so than shooting accurately, what the prone can really do for you is turn even the smallest defilade into some level of cover. Even the curb at the edge of a sidewalk can become meaningful cover shooting from a prone position. I want to discuss shooting multiple targets. This is something I could go on about at Astra, but I just want to hit a couple of the high points. The first one is the mantra, fire until the threat is neutralized. We hear that, we practice that, and the problem is people get funneled in and keep firing at target number one while neglecting target two, three, four. 
you've got to traverse. What direction you'd go would depend on the situation. Another very important thing is you have to fire only as fast as you can hit. Now let me shoot six shots as fast as I can. Well that was pretty fast, but it didn't do me a lot of good. Now let me shoot these as fast as I can reliably hit them. Yeah, that took longer, but it doesn't matter how fast you get to target number six if target two, four, or five are still left unshot. In shooting multiple targets, you may have to traverse a wide front and you need a stance commensurate with that. An isosceles stance can be very good for traversing a wide front. A weaver stance can be very good for that. Now there are people who criticize the weaver stance and say that a right-handed shooter can't really traverse to the left. And you may have seen me demonstrate this before. Looks okay to me. Now when you have to traverse angles greater than 90 degrees, it's a good idea to pivot. Just like you did in PE class in school when you were playing basketball. Now that comes with a few concerns. One of them is, as you swing around, you've now covered about 25% of humanity with your muzzle. Another is the inertia of swinging like that. You might get a little wobble in there when you try to stop. There's also the matter that if things are close to you, as you're swinging around, who knows what you might hit with your arm or your pistol. So to overcome that, what I'll do is, if I have to fire, I will bring the pistol down as I pivot and then come straight back up on target. So let's see how that works. Let's try that again. Some people will tell you that bringing it down when you pivot is a little slower, but it's what works for me. And there you have it. In part one, we talked about shooting from cover, part two, shooting and moving, part three, reloading in a couple of shooting positions. And as I've said before, I could go on for days, but I just wanted to hit a few of the high points. Recently, some people have asked me about de-escalation techniques. Well, if there's a part four, that'll be it. And of course, whatever we have to recap from part three. So until then, don't try this at home. I'm what you call a professional. And thanks for watching the series on tactics.